Sorry, let's record on the computer. Okay. Um, okay, so it officially is recording. So, so basically, as, as I said, this is how we're kind of going to do it. Um, I'm going to record an opening later on after the show. Uh, I'm going to use a little bit of music probably behind it. And I have these really, this great team in Louisville, Kentucky, this company called Resonate Recording um, that edits my podcasts and a million oh, other people's podcasts. They really, sound fantastic. Yeah, yeah, they, 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 they do a great job. I've been really mm -hmm. happy that working with them. And um, I'm probably, with your permission, going to use the opening of Used Cars, if that's okay. Uh, it's kind of hard not to use my little sister in the back seat with an ice cream cone, um, just as part of the opening music, but only with your permission. If, if, if you don't want me to, I won't, that's fine. Um, <laughs> I can't <tell> Feeny. <laughs> um, and then probably close with uh, a little darkness for Frank. Um, and, um, so basically, I'll re-record. I'll record the open later. So what I'd like to do to start the show, and we're recording now, but again, the editing people will know when to start. Um, I want Frank basically to open up the show by just start telling the story of how you met Pam, and let Pam comment on that and jump in, you know, as it just makes sense, just you know, organically. Um, you mentioned. Uh, um, well, you specifically mentioned how you wanted a camera when you were 19, I think, on your Instagram show, but um, I'll, I'll get to that later on. So, so I'm just going to count down three, two, one, and Frank, you'll just tell the story like you told me yesterday of getting a phone call um, to pick up somebody at the airport, and we'll, we'll go from there. Three, two, one. So Bruce said uh, we had worked in 1978 on darkness on the edge of town with quite a few sessions. Uh, and then in 1980, we did the river. In 1982, we did Nebraska, uh, even though I didn't get the cover. Uh, David got the cover of that one. But um, David Michael Kennedy, that is. Uh, but somewhere in there, and I'm not sure if it was 78, 80, or 82, somewhere in there with Bruce coming back and forth, 82, that's what I thought, uh, during the, during the uh, Nebraska shoots. You, you're, we are, yes. Okay, so... Bruce gives me a call, I, you know, pick up the phone. Hey, Frank, it's Bruce. I'm up here at Newark Airport. I'm picking up my sister, Pammy. She's getting into photography. Can we come down and check out your dark room? Uh, sure. <laughs> what are you doing? I'll be here. Come on. So they drive some 65, 70 miles down the New Jersey Turnpike to Haddonfield, New Jersey, where uh, I was living at the time. And I had a... Um, my father and I had built a, a dark room in the, in the basement of the house uh, that I was living in. And uh, Pam and Bruce came down and uh, looked around. And as I recall, Pam was very shy. She didn't say much, but she took everything in, saw the enlargers, she saw the table, the wet part and the dry part, and you know, and all the supplies I had up on the shelves and everything. And uh, and uh, that was that. And they, you know, you want some soda, you want some <laughs> beer. We got in the car and back up to uh, North Jersey, they hightailed it. Pam, how do you remember that? Yes. Well, first of all, I want to say how fun and how crazy it is that I'm doing this show with Frank because what Frank doesn't know is when I was maybe, I don't know, 16. Um, my mom in our house had a room and the room was full of all of Bruce's things, all of the scrapbooks that she kept, photos that were sent to her, gold records were kept in there. So it was like this, this treasure chest, this room of, of really fun things to go through. So I used to go in there and look around, but there were some proof sheets that were sitting on a shelf and I was just drawn to these proof sheets. Wow. And they were Frank. Um, of course, I didn't know Frank at the time, um, but it was the photo that Bruce used on the cover of his book, Frank's photo. And there was the proof sheet of it in this closet type room. Um, and I was so drawn to it 
at that age, before I was ever taken to Frank's house or to see his dark room or anything, I cut out the photo from the proof sheet and put it in a little frame, a little flowered, little white flowered frame, which I have on my shelf in my office at home to this day. Oh, <laughs> that is so sweet. That is so sweet. So here we are some 42 years later, yeah. and, and today both Frank and Pam have their body of work of beautiful photographs available through one of the world's leading fine art music photography homes, the Morrison Hotel Gallery, along with those who made and continue to make an indelible mark on music culture with photographic portrayal of the industry's most influential artists. Both Frank and Pam have an interesting duality to their lives and their work, and, and we're gonna explore that a bit deeper, their stories, their work, and also how they're both managing in this new normal as we head into our third month now in New Jersey of quarantine from uh, coronavirus. So Pam, you're back living in New Jersey with your daughter, Ruby, yeah. after spending most of your life in California. Um, but I'd like to go back to 1969 specifically, uh, mostly because of a photo that you have um, when your folks packed up the Rambler in Freehold and headed out west. And you showed that photo recently on, on the wonderful Instagram special you had. Tell us a little bit about that photograph, um, what that's meant to you, and, and your journey out to California at seven years old? Yep, seven and a half, yeah. Um, yeah, so, you know, my parents decided that they wanted to move to California across the country in 1969. Um, I guess at the time, a lot of people were moving to California. It was the place to go, land of opportunity and sunshine all the time. And um, they packed up the car. My brother was 19. My sister was 18. Um, they were, you know, very much in full swing of their own lives. And um, they packed up the car and off we went. And all their belongings were literally on the roof of the roof rack. Um, of that car, which was a Buick Rambler. Mm. And um, I was in the back seat with a cooler filled with uh, snacks and Coca-Cola. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Uh, yep, they had $2,000 and they didn't know where they were going. They didn't know anyone in California. They didn't have jobs in California. So it was really, really adventurous. Hmm. Um, it was a huge adventure. And so they packed up the car in the photo that you're referring to. You can see the roof rack and all the, mm -hmm. all our, um, sorry, um, all our belongings on the roof. My mom says, and I, I vaguely remember this, that we got about a mile down the road and everything fell off the roof. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't tied down properly. <laughs> Sounds about right for most road trips. <laughs> right. So out of the car they got, put everything back on the roof, and across country we went. We, we literally, they had enough money to stay in a motel every other night. So we would stay at a Motel 6 or a travel lodge, my mom said, so that I could swim in the pool. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the next night we would sleep in the car, and across country we went. That photo... Uh, is, is really important for me. It symbolizes that journey, which was a, a major experience in my life and a major move in my life. Um, and I, I guess the, the, the place was called the um, old, well, now I'm forgetting. Um, well, now I'm forgetting what the name of the building is. Hang on a second. That's no, okay. I have it here. Um, this is on your way. West, it, was the, it was the old, yeah, the plate. We stopped at the Old West Museum. At the Old West Museum, okay. The Old West Museum. And so they had covered wagons and they had, you know, all kinds of stuff from the pioneer days, which was sort of symbolic because there we were pioneers in 1969 moving sure. across country, right? So um, when we were leaving, my dad picked me up and put me on the roof and took that photo. Hmm. And I just, it's, it's very vivid in my mind, that memory. Um, and uh, yeah, so from there, we, we made it to San Francisco. 
And, and why did you uh, choose San Francisco? Why did they choose oh, San Francisco? Well, my mom says they chose San Francisco because Bruce had a girlfriend that had been there and said it was nice. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, she must have been 17 or 18. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> she knew. But that, that's and what actually, been going on. <laughs> in San Francisco in 1969, boy, that was, uh, yeah. that was not freehold anymore. That's right. That was not freehold anymore. So we, we arrived, um, we arrived in California. We drove first, we drove through Sausalito and then we drove through Golden Gate Park and, uh, it was, it was, yeah, we were not in freehold anymore. Yeah. Um, so my parents stopped at a, a real estate agency or whatever to look for a place to live. And the woman there said, you don't want to raise a child here. Go down 30 miles down the coast. So they did. So they drove about 30 miles south mm -hmm. and ended up in a town called San Mateo. Right. We lived in a motel for a month. My mother found a job. They enrolled me in school and they stayed there for 29 years. Hmm. And you, you know, spent most of your youth there. And then at what age did you head down to L.A.? I moved to L.A. when I was 18. Yes, because Bruce had a girlfriend that said it was nice. Oh, well, <laughs> I... I... None of these things are surprising, I think, to anyone well, listening. <laughs> well, you know, when you're 18 and, and San Mateo, you know, is the Bay Area, really great place to grow up, a really beautiful area. But L.A. was where it was all happening. So even right. though I didn't know anything about it, I knew we went to Disneyland every year, once a year. Mm -hmm. um, but I really didn't know, you know, I was 18, 18 years old. I was really kind of naive. And, um, but it just seemed like that's the place to go. So I said to my mom, when I turn 18, I'm going to LA. You actually were, you paid and went into Disneyland, unlike your brother and Steve Van Zandt, who snuck in. And um, we did not have bandanas on. <laughs> yes, so exactly. So they let us stay. <laughs> <laughs> so you're you're in L.A. It's the early '80s. Ironically, I was living in L.A. at the same time um, after working for Larry King and working in in TV uh, and doing a variety of different things, including being on Love Connection, which I shared with you earlier. Yeah. Um, but it was a it was a crazy time, and you you actually got to appear in one of the greatest movies of all time. Now, was there an acting bug? Something that just you know, how did the Fast Times at Ridgemont High thing happen? Yeah, no, there was no acting bug. Acting was the furthest thing from my mind. Um, I was, as Frank said, I was very shy. So acting was not on my list of things that I was very interested in doing at all. Um, but the way that I got into that um, was Bruce was doing a show, I believe it was at the sports arena, and um, it was backstage. And there was a casting director there named Eve Branstein, who cast lots of um, Norman Lear shows. <laughs> and um, she didn't know who I was, but she uh, came up to me and, that, and she, she cast One Day at a Time, um, also with one of her shows, and Facts of Life and all right. those shows. Oh, sure. So, yeah. So she came up to me and she said, you know, are you, who, what's your name? Are you interested in acting? And, uh, would you like to come and audition? And for me, it was just, I think I had just turned 18, didn't really know what I was going to do. And I suddenly saw this other world open up to me. Right. So I said, yes. And, and down to LA, I went, of course, I had never acted before in my entire life and had no idea what I was doing. So you're never um, in the school shows. That wasn't you. So, oh no, that wasn't me. <laughs> um, so, but she was really nice. And she cast me initially as like little extra roles on facts of life. And then I'd get a line here or there. And then I got an agent and, um, I auditioned, my very first audition was for Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Wow. Wow. And, so I was and to work with Cameron Crowe, one of the great writers of all time and probably the director of one of my fa favorite movies of all time, Almost Famous. I'm sure that was, yeah. the whole experience was fun and anyone wants, wants to watch uh, Fast Times, Pam yeah. is, uh, uh, I believe, a cheerleader, has a, a nice scene at the, at, the, at the football field or something like that, if I recall. Yeah, I have a few, a few scenes. Dina yeah. Phillips. Dina Phillips. Two. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, they were they were crazy times. We probably crossed paths at the whiskey at some point um, <laughs> yeah. during that period. So 
before we move on, Pam, I mentioned earlier that both Frank and Pam kind of have this duality in their lives. And, and Frank, I'm not sure anyone has ever said this to you, but I kind of see you as a Clark Kent Superman kind of guy um, in the world of rock photography. You know, by day, this mild-mannered, you know, hardworking guy. Um, but at night, there you go. You know, you would run out and strap on the camera, not a cape. And suddenly you're hitting all the coolest clubs in Philly and in New York and in the village and, and capturing this amazing time in rock music. So I guess the question is, how did you get into photography in the first place? Who handed you your first camera? The, uh, yeah, I've written about this in my book, but the, um, my father. Uh, my father, I, I was rooting through a, a, a drawer in our dining room and I found this old Kodak brownie box camera. And it was literally a box camera. Uh, it took 120 roll film. He showed me how to load it up. Uh, I loaded it up. I went out into the streets of North Camden, New Jersey, where I lived at the time. Just shot pictures and uh, brought the film to the local drugstore a couple blocks away and couldn't wait for a week or two until they were processed. I ran back and looked at those photos and learned from that and then put a couple more rolls in and, you know, and, and that evolved uh, over the years. Um, you know, the, the Brownie box camera went to an, a Brownie, uh, a different camera with a flash on it and then uh, an Ansco camera and then, a, you know, little by little. Then finally I got my first 35 millimeter camera at Sears Roebuck. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it was it was either called Tower or something. I don't remember the name of the camera, but sure. uh, that's the first one I ever used. And then, of course, went through a myriad of uh, 35 millimeter cameras uh, uh, over the years and ultimately worked my way up. And then I got into medium format. I had a um, Mamiya or a Mamiya, however you pronounce it, uh, RB67. And I remember the first time I bought it, uh, I, I was shooting Patty Smith and, and she said, what's the RB stand for? And I said, rhythm and blues. And so, <laughs> uh, you know. Uh, you went to college with Patty Smith. Went to college with Patty. Um, was that Glassboro? Where, what, what Glassboro school? State Teachers College. Oh, wow. They weren't ready for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, it, was it Glassboro the place that also held the, the meeting with Khrushchev? And, yeah, 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 I yeah. So, yeah. The, big, uh, the big summit meeting, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, back in Backing up through the cameras, I went through all these cameras and all, but uh, you were talking about going, you know, the, the dual life, the sure. Superman. Um, I got married to my first wife who uh, passed away from cancer many, many, many years ago, but uh, she's the mother of my children. And um, uh, so I, I married at 21 years old and, um, and I was working. I had a day right. job, you know, I had to support my family. Uh, most of my friends were living in New York and Soho at the time. A lot of my friends that I went to high school with and gravitated up to Manhattan. So I would go up to Manhattan on, on many, not every weekend, because I wanted to spend time at home with the family, but every other weekend or every third weekend, I'd be up with my friends in New York. And we'd go to all these uh, clubs and, and, and I met, a lot of people that knew a lot of people and it was right. a, a wild time cbgb's max's kansas city the the cafe wa the you know the whole village scene and sure. uh, the, the, the firehouse which was a a place where a lot of the uh, the, the um, uh, people downtown and Soho, the gay people would gravitate to so there was like you know i'd go to parties robert Rauschenberg's party and this guy's party and yeah, I remember going to a party where Jay Giles' band was the house band playing on one floor, and there were two other floors, and it was party. It was crazy. It I'm was sure. oh, it was an incredible time. And I'd go back and and be Mister Go to Work and come home and take care of the family. But you know, I I wanted so much to be in Manhattan to have a. Uh, my own studio in Manhattan and have people come and I'd have the lights and the backdrops and, you know, uh, go out and have dinner with folks and such and such. I, I couldn't afford it. I didn't have the money, you know, and, uh, and uh, so I just kept on trudging along. 
Mm -hmm. doing my family thing and then taking pictures on the side. And then ultimately, now, you weren't teaching, though. I know you went to a teacher's college. No, no. no. Uh, that, Patty, as you said, Patty Smith and I were in that same teacher's college. Um, she left early. Right. Um, and headed up to New York. And, uh, you know, it was mm -hmm. the end of the farmlands of South Jersey to, yeah. the, the, you know, to the city. I left shortly after her. Um, we both left with a lot of credits, but uh, we didn't stay to matriculate. Um, so it was an interesting time. Uh, there were a lot of crazy people down there. Uh, uh, um, one of Patty's friends, we call her Chaps, Janet Hamill, who is a pub big published poet and a good friend of Patty's. She was there. There were a lot of characters there, actors and you know, artists and such, but uh, it was it was good. But we were kind of a, a microcosm within this whole bucolic thing going on. So right. Uh, anyway. and you were taking photos at that time of Patty, was, right, uh, and of everybody. Yeah. Oh, no, yeah. no, 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 I didn't. No. When I knew Patty in college, I, I wrote about her in my my book, Patty Smith, American Artist, and I said that you know we used to congregate in the uh, the co-op, which was a place in between classes that we would go and there were booths and there was a jukebox that had the coolest stuff on it, the Rolling Stones, Bob Dylan, you know, all that kind of stuff on it. And you get a hamburger and you sit down and you, you know, take some notes, study your books, whatever, congregate. Patty had this little group of people, Janet Hamill, uh, George Purse Fonts, who was a, an actor, a thespian, and a bunch of other folks. And I didn't know Patty, and I saw these cool bohemian type people sitting in the booth next to me, and I was looking in my biology book, and I looked up, and the doors coming into the co-op, they were kind of swinging doors, and when they opened up, I said it created a vacuum, and there was this vision of this woman in a white leather, floor-length white leather coat, and black, black, raven black hair all down her back, and she come moseying into the co-op like a, an outlaw in a Western movie. You know? And she saw her friend Janet. She said, chaps, fire of my loins, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, now, this is a person I must get to know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we became lifelong friends. Matter right. of fact, we just spoke to her about something uh, last week. And... Uh, so uh, I didn't photograph her, though, until I started going up to, when she moved up to New right. York. And um, my friends from, my friend Ken Tisa from uh, high school and uh, his friend, um, uh, also uh, Howie Michaels, and, and of course, another guy named uh, Robert Maplethorpe. Yes. Uh, uh, and there are a bunch of other really cool folks, sure. all were at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's where they first went. Patty, of course, went up to see Howie and and uh, and Kenny, but ran into Robert, and that whole story is exactly it's just kids by Patty Smith. Absolutely, uh, which is yeah. a wonderful story. So but, work us work us to the uh, the the connection with Patty, uh, where Bruce writes a, writes this terrific song and having a difficult time finishing the lyric and approaches Patty. And then obviously we have the epic because the night, but somebody else got a little bit of a benefit from that conversation, I believe. Well, Patty had left, uh, you know, she was living in Manhattan with Robert Mablethorpe. And um, at the time, you know, she, right. everybody had left Pratt by this time. And so I was in Manhattan with all my friends and um, I would visit Patty and I would start photographing Patty. And um, because she was, you know, very, very photogenic and uh, just wonderful to photograph. So uh, the, the best stuff I did was when I got this new RB67 medium format. And I, you know, gave her a lot of the uh, prints that I had made from these sessions. And um, Patty was working on an album uh, called Easter. The cover was photographed by Lynn Goldsmith. Right. Uh, she was working in the record plant, West, 40, uh, West 45th Street, in Manhattan, and in one studio. In the other studio was Bruce Springsteen and the East Street Band, 
working on an album called Darkness on the Edge of Town. And in between sessions, sometimes uh, they would get together. Um, and Patty was living, I think, at one point on uh, McDougal Street, 109, I believe, McDougal Street in the village. And Bruce had seen a lot of the photographs that I had photographed, you know, that I had given her. And he said, you know, who, who did this? Who did this? And uh, she says, it's my friend Frank. Frank, Frank is your biggest fan in South Jersey. You know, <laughs> he told me about you and all this stuff, you know. So, um, yeah, uh, you know, as fate would have it, uh, Bruce was backstage at Patty's, I think at the bottom line, at a show at the bottom line. And Patty said, you know, you should get Frank to photograph you sometime, you know. Somewhere in between all that, they were working on Because the Night together. Right. You know, he finished up, he had started it, and she finished sure. it. So uh, she called me up one day and she said, Frank, uh, Bruce Springsteen's here and he's looking through your photographs at my place and he really likes your work, you know, and uh, do you, would, would you be okay if the, to photograph him at some point? And of course, mm -hmm. second, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I didn't hear anything for a few months and then one day out of the blue, uh, got a phone call and he says, hey, Frank, this is Bruce. Let's get together and make some photos, you know. <laughs> and I said, Bruce, Bruce, you know, Springsteen, Patty. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> that was 19, early 1978. Right. Um, my God, we've been doing things mm -hmm. together now for 43 years, 42 mm -hmm. years. So it's been a long relationship. And yeah. uh, So he can't, just to, for those that don't know the story, Bruce comes down to your home in Haddonfield, New Jersey, and you decide to start taking pictures, I believe, in your bedroom um, with this really interesting background of wallpaper. Um, and just what, what do you remember about those sessions the most? Well, you know, when we had talked on the phone, I said, do you want me to come up to New York or North Jersey or do you want to come down to my place? He said, no, I'll come down to your place, you know. So the first day he came down in a white Chevy pickup truck with uh, rust all over the bottom, a couple of tree trunks in the back because it was winter mm -hmm. and icy roads. And he used that for traction on the rear wheels. And uh, we sat down in my living room. I introduced him to my wife and my two little children. Uh, and uh, we started looking at some of my photos in my portfolio mm -hmm. and we started talking. And we found out that, or at least I found out, I think he realized it. He started feeling comfortable with me. I felt comfortable with him because we both had Italian mothers, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, non-Italian fathers. And they all came, you know, we're blue collar people coming, live, you know, living the Jersey experience and such and such. And we both liked the same kind of music and, you know, mm -hmm. kind of new. So we hit it off and it was comfortable and we started working uh, that day in Haddonfield, and we did this over several weeks. And at one point, he actually came down with two big, gigantic, uh, what I call pimp mobiles, mm -hmm. gig gigantic automobiles. One was Clarence's, and the other was Stevens. And the whole East Street band and crammed into these two cars <laughs> and came to my house to do some, you know, location stuff uh, in Haddonfield. And right. then ultimately, I went up to New York and did some rooftop. And that was all in 1978. Yeah. Yep. Amazing. And all these photos, uh, folks, are in further up the road. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that later, this, this incredible anthology of, of Frank's work. Um, I want to pivot back to Pam for a second and hear about your transition to photography, how you learned your craft. But again, I learned something else the other night watching you, is that it all started out in a dream for you. Uh -huh. uh, yes, and that is a true story. Um, I was, when I was, um, about 19, oh, well, I was working on Fast Times at Ridgemont High and I met Neil Preston, um, and Neil Pre Preston invited me to a Stevie Nicks concert that he was shooting. That was the first time that I had really, um, seen anybody actually work like that. And Neil was great at, at, I mean, Neil's photos are amazing and, and he's shot everybody. Um, but I saw him working and I thought, I I love that. I love that. I want to get a camera. So for my 19th birthday, I asked my mom and dad her camera, and uh, and I got one. 
Um, so I just started taking pictures. I was still acting. I didn't think of photography as a career or anything like that. Um, and I just started taking pictures of things that I liked, my friends, my family, my mom, my dad. Um, I moved to New York for a few months. I walked around the city and, and shot a lot there. Um, and then I ended up back in LA and I was happy that I um, had the experience of acting, but it was not my passion. It was not mm. something that really I felt was me. Um, and so I was pretty unsatisfied. And I had had my camera for a little while. And in my dream, I had a dream one night that I came home. And at the time, I was living in a little garage apartment, an apartment above the garage. And I came home one day, and my apartment had burned to the ground. Everything I owned was gone. Nothing was left standing. And in the middle of all the rubble was my camera on a tripod. And I said to myself that day, when I woke up from that dream, I said, that's a sign. I'm, I'm, I'm going for it. So that was really the turning point for me start looking into how I could maybe do this professionally hmm. amazing so, yeah. so you kind of you kind of realized um, you were born to be a photographer that was really your that was, was that was your thing. calling that was your it calling was, it was and my call. and you sought out a position with a really famous photographer and get Glenn Wexler I believe and you you know you stayed with it you talked about for three weeks he didn't get back to you, but you continued and you pursued and you persisted and he offered you an internship. Um, yeah. and, and Glenn was doing a lot of uh, album covers, I, you know. Yeah, he was doing a lot of, um, he had done a lot of album covers and was also doing a lot of advertising. Right. Um, so yeah, um, I didn't know anything. And so I didn't even know that I couldn't be an assistant. <laughs> that's how little I knew. That's, that's cool. <laughs> So I walked in and I said, can I be your assistant? <laughs> and he was like, but you don't know, even like, I didn't know how to load a Hasselblad. I didn't know how to plug in a light. I didn't know how to take a meter reading. I didn't know anything. <laughs> so, but, you know, sometimes it's good to be naive, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And have people take a chance on you and, 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 <laughs> yeah. and yeah. And so what, luckily what, he, yeah. yes. Now, I was going to say, what did you yeah. learn really at the end of the day from, from Glenn that helped begin develop your own style? Um, well, Glenn, Glenn is a master at what he does. Glenn, um, technically, I mean, first of all, his images, his images are, are amazing. His, his portraits of people are, are so wonderful. Um, but at the time, he was also doing a lot of... Um, compositing of images and putting them together, but there was no Photoshop, so you had to do them in the dark room. So you really had to know what you were doing. <laughs> you couldn't just, it wasn't just about, you know, going out with a camera and taking the pictures. No, this was real. He had to know what he was doing, and I was the beneficiary of that. He was extremely generous with all of his knowledge. Um, he taught me how to light. He taught me how to print and you could not make a mistake with him. Like it, to, to the second, his prints had to be perfect. And so I really learned how to do things right. Mm. And he also is very good at running his business. So right. I learned a little right. bit about that. Exactly. So well. at this point you start, you, you're starting to photograph some musicians and you know, you had one in the family, but obviously being 13 years younger yeah. than Bruce and on a different coast, this was a whole new world for you too. So right. when you're photographing an artist um, or musician, are you trying to amplify the image they already have or create a new one with your work? Okay, good question. Um, I don't even actually think about that at all. I don't think about amplifying an image or creating an Frank's image. Frank's nodding. Frank's agreeing on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it doesn't even really cross my mind. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> and and yeah, and um, so you know when I when I went into photography, when I started working for Glenn, I, I didn't think of myself as um, gee, I'm, I want to become a music photographer. I, I didn't think about that at all, actually. I didn't really know what kind of photographer I wanted to be. I just knew that I wanted to do photography and maybe I would go into fashion, even though I didn't know anything about fashion. Um, I, I just didn't know. And so I was just shooting. Um, it wasn't something I actually set out to do. Um, it just sort of unfolded that way. And I'm so glad it, that it did. But I had a friend, um, my best friend, actually, she worked at A&M Records. And um, so there were some new artists there and I would just play around in Glenn's studio at night, taking some photos of them just for fun, practice. And that led to somebody at um, the re, uh, redeveloped, whatever, Cream Magazine um, right. in the early 90s. Right, Cream Magazine. Mm -hmm. So he had, he had the, pub, the publisher of that magazine had seen some of my photos, just at a, literally at a party, and uh, called me up. He probably didn't know I actually wasn't a photographer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and called me up and said, would you like, I'm launching this magazine. Would you like to shoot for it? And I said, sure. And that is really what got me going in that world because I shot so many people for that magazine. But you know, when I go in to do a shoot, I don't think about image or anything like that. I think about trying to connect with the person and, and bringing out something real in the moment. Mm -hmm. um, Who were some of the most memorable people that you, when you shot for Cream? Uh at that time well my very first shoot was with was not was um and uh, that was pretty exciting um i shot um let's see for them uh keith i believe was for spin um i did uh neil young of course right and you that had was, said yeah it was supposed to be up at his ranch and it wound up being um yeah yeah yeah, in the studio. There, yeah. Or in a hotel. I like, or, these, or I like these stories because, you know, um, these are the things that, that you have to really deal with in the real world when you're working, right? right? So you go out there and you don't start out with all this confidence. Confidence is something that you earn as you go along. <laughs> and uh, often it's through the mistakes that you make. And everybody makes mistakes. So I like the stories where that there were challenges and that that was one of them because um you know the idea of going to neil young's ranch and shooting him there that's a photographer's dream <laughs> then i mean shooting neil young a is great that was i was right. for, believe me very excited no matter where they told me i had to do it um but then you know you go to a video shoot and you're not you're not uh, the priority there right and so we had to wait hours which is not uncommon. Which song, which yeah. video was he shooting for? Do you remember what, what was the song? Uh, I, you know, I'm sorry, I don't was remember. Was it during the Harvest Moon it. period? It was. It was shot in a church. Mm -hmm. Um, I have to look it up. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, that's all right. yeah. He had a whole choir and everything. It yeah, was, it was quite amazing. Actually, it was really fun just hanging out there and watching. Right. Um, no, I'm sure. I, yeah. I'm sure it was. So you also mentioned in 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 an Instagram specifically around this time. This is when Tunnel of Love. Uh, had come out in the late, the, you know, later in the 80s. And Bruce had you take some really amazing candid shots in, in his home, I imagine in, in Rumson at the time. Um, mm -hmm. and, and one particularly that, that resonates with me um, is the shot of him writing uh, at, at his, I guess this is, his, uh, is this a kitchen table or a, a writing desk? His writing desk. It's a writing desk, yeah. I mean, it's just... Everything about this image, uh, folks, is you need to absolutely take a look at this um, in the links. Um, but describe describe that emotion and and you know obviously he's your brother, but you know just what's happening in this picture. Right. Well, um, it was uh, I believe that was um, yeah it was like the mid eighties. So um, you know I wasn't really a photographer yet. Um, I didn't do that as a profession at that time. And um, I had taken some pictures of my dad that I sent to my brother and, and he liked. And so he asked me to come out and take some photos of him. So I literally just flew out from LA 
and um, we hung out one afternoon, just very casually, me, a camera, him, some film, and we took some photos in the recording studio, which was above the garage in his house in Rumson. Mm -hmm. And um, then we went out in his um, yellow, I think it was a Cadillac, big, big yellow Cadillac, which he did use that photo for something recently. Mm -hmm. um, we went driving around in that, and then we went back to the house and went upstairs to his writing room. And it was, I don't know, none of it was really very planned. It was just kind of, which is what I love about shooting him actually, um, is that that's always how it kind of is with us. It's just sort of hanging out, hanging out. And um, he sat down at the table and opened up his notebook and, mm -hmm. You know, you try to just be a fly on the wall, <laughs> right? You know, and stay out of the way and capture the moment. In many ways, uh, if I'm correct, one of those photos was used for the single sleeve for Brilliant Disguise, um, yeah. and in many ways, you were kind of that Brilliant Disguise in the room there. So it's uh, it's a nice, <laughs> nice, nice the way that that ties well, it, yourself in. You know. It was exciting for yeah. me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very exciting. <laughs> so I want to talk cameras for a little bit. Frank, and again, I know we've, you mentioned a number of them, and you've done really just incredible work with, with both a Hasselblad and, and a Leica. Um, what, what, did certain photographers influence you growing up and from the past that led you to use that particular equipment and develop um, your own style? And, and before you answer that, I actually want to quote Bruce um, from his biography, because I think it ties really well into, into this particular question. Um, Bruce wrote about you. His talent was he managed to strip about your celebrity, your artifice, and get to the raw you. His photos had a purity and a street poetry to them. They were lovely and true, but they weren't slick. Frank looked for your true grit. Bruce went on to also say that your pictures captured the people I was writing about in my songs and showed me the part of me that was still one of them. I just love that quote, but I think it kind of works back to, to, to the question of, of maybe photographers that influenced you as you were, you know, starting your career and throughout your career. First of all, um, Tammy is the Hasselblad person. I, I, I never had a Hasselblad, couldn't afford a, a Hasselblad. Uh, I now have some Leicas and, and some other things, but um, back to the, the, the photographing, though, um, of people. Pam had, had um, hit on it, and, uh, and you know, I, I talked the same way. Somebody had asked me uh, regarding the Darkness album. Oh, uh, sorry, one more minute. Back to Pam. Sure. One of the most beautiful things she's done recently, you know, and I don't want to get ahead of where you're going, Mitch, but... She was invited down to Luck uh, Farm, down to, down to Willie Nelson's place, to do uh, one of his most recent albums. And the photography is magnificent. I was so jealous. <laughs> oh, it's spectacular. And, and um, that is actually a photograph I'm going to be ordering. Um, I already have a, a beautiful spot. Uh, my wife loves horses. And I'm debating between the horse shot, which is just just incredible and reminds us of uh, a trip we took recently in Kentucky. But uh, yeah, the, the shots of Willie with trigger his guitar, those are, those are terrific. And, and definitely we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit, but so what is it about photography that motivates you, Frank? People had said uh, regarding the darkness I've been interviewed. Yeah. Well, you know, what, uh, what were you thinking when you developed that character uh, when you were shooting Bruce and you and you were developing that character to to, uh, to uh, you know that were so close to the characters that Bruce would you know were singing about was talking about mm -hmm. in darkness and ultimately in the river as well which is right as well and so forth you know um, even even uh, when I did the shoot for uh, Nebraska even you know uh, it was a tremendous amount of work we did together I. The answer I gave was, I was never shooting these characters. Like Pam had mentioned earlier, you go in with your camera, you're alone with your subject, or you have, you know, some, maybe some lighting people or something, but you're basically, it's basically one-on-one. -on -one. 
And um, I wasn't shooting, uh, you know, Johnny 99, or I wasn't shooting mm -hmm. you know, this guy or that guy. I was shooting the young man that was in front of me and who was Bruce Springsteen. And I was shooting the essence of that young man that I saw in front of me. And nothing contrived. It was just, this is the guy I'm, I'm photographing. I want to make sure I want to get the lighting as best I can. I want to get some emotion out of them. We would do, use different, uh, different areas, different uh, positions, different poses, different, you know, uh, and, and then Bruce would give you the rest or anybody else there, Patty Smith or uh, Southside Johnny or anybody else that I had photographed, you know, you pull a little bit, but they give you, you know, it's Danny Clinch is the first one to say it. It's a, a mutual thing. It's a, you know, uh, you're two people working together, you know, right. Right. A little bit of give and a little bit of take. And, uh, and if you see me, because that's the thing about most of the good photographers that I know, and you were talking about who my influences were, um, but not to lose my thought, if you see truly a good photographer sees things that most people just take for granted or walk right past, you know, um, you have to have the uh, intelligence and the eye to note that when you see something and it makes sense in your mind, and, it, and then you're going to put that graphically onto a piece of paper or a slide or a movie or whatever, um, you know, because I, I consider the great cinematographers great photographers and great artists as well. So if you can do that um, consistently over a lifetime, and one day somebody says, hey, that's a good photographer, you know, <laughs> so that's, that's what we strive for. But my influences in the early days were um, uh, Edward Steichen, Alfred Stieglitz. They were sure. two of the old world great artists. Right. Uh, responsible for actually turning uh, the, the uh, mechanics of photography into an art form. Right. And Life of, magazine. Did Stieglitz, wasn't he involved with Life some of his great uh, yeah. photographs, like Peerage, and right. um, Eichen did a photograph of uh, J. Paul Getty sitting in a chair, and he had highlighted, there was a stream of light that went on one arm of the chair, and it looks like he's carrying a knife. It's, it's like he has a knife, you know. This is a big financier. Sure. Um, then to get a little bit offbeat, another one was Deanne Arbus. Um, she's one of my favorites, too, because of, you know, just the fact that uh, she was not traditional. She saw things completely differently. And, um, you know, so those, those uh, photographers were some, you know, there were a lot, a lot of them, but right. uh, that was partly the nucleus of people that I tried to uh, not emulate, but to learn from. Sure. And, you know, you, you didn't mention her name, but I, I, I love this quote from Annie Leibovitz, um, who obviously I think fits in, in many ways in the genre too, is that she, she said once that one doesn't stop seeing, one doesn't stop framing. It doesn't turn off and turn on. It's on all the time. Um, I guess for both of you, do you find yourself, even if you don't have a camera in your hand, mentally taking pictures? I mean, Pam, here we are in, in this quarantine world and probably not what you were, were expecting um, with your time in New Jersey. Um, and, but but do, you, do you find that, that you're just kind of mentally taking pictures all the time? All the time, all the time. It drives my daughter crazy. Because <laughs> I look at her and I'm like, I gotta get that shot. <laughs> that looks so great. Look at the light, the light on you right now is so perfect. Wait, 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 let me just get it. Uh, and of course she's 17, so she wants yeah. nothing to do with that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That, that's certainly the age. You, um, but yeah. once, you, once you actually get outside, there probably are plenty of things to, to, to be looking at um, as well. Frank, do you find that throughout, no matter where you are? And, you know, and I've been with you at concerts and variety of different places, but, you know, you're just kind of always in your head thinking about that yeah. image. I think I, I told you a story last night about being at one of Bruce's concerts in Philly and, and right. standing photographs in the crowd and Dave Marsh walked by and said, Frank, I didn't know you were a paparazzo. <laughs> <laughs> and these so, photos uh, and the photos from the Philadelphia show in 2016 
are also in Frank's book further on up the road. They're, they're, I was there a few feet away from him pretending to be a photographer with my iPhone, but his shots are just magnificent. Concert in Milan was in there and, and a few others. But no, what happens, what Pam's referring to, what I was referring to, over a period of time, your eyes become camera lenses. You see things with your eyes as if you were through the viewfinder and you're always composing, you're always appreciating if there's light like on Ruby and, and mm -hmm. so forth. Uh, so that, you know, if you don't do that, if it doesn't truly like that, then I, I don't think you could ever really truly be a photographer. Mm -hmm. Pam, I wanted to jump back uh, past doing the cream and, and obviously you've done Rolling Stone and Spin, but you really, really got into uh, hip hop very early and, and you know, doing photography, uh, Ice Cube specifically. Um, talk a little bit about what you liked about not only the hip hop music, but the, the generation and, and what you found and were able to create such great images um, and album covers and you know, and Ice Cube specifically coming up with the idea of what you did with his face that wound up being part of uh, really his shows. Yeah, it did. Well, that's kind of an interesting um, part of my career because it, it I, I was a fan of the music, but I think I started getting those jobs because the way, I actually don't really know for sure, but the way that I, the way that I shot and the way that I lit was always very moody with lots of shadows, dark shadows and grainy. And, and I think my style um, uh, just sort of lent itself um, to being hired for those jobs. Um, the first time I shot Ice Cube was for uh, Spin Magazine. And um, he came to my studio and uh, he had a big entourage. Um, he was very easy to work with, although there wasn't really a lot of communication between us. I mean, that really is the whole thing about shooting anybody. It doesn't matter who you're shooting, is that you have to create the trust. You have to create um, an environment where the person that you're photographing trusts you and feels safe with you and knows that they can let down their guard and open up and have fun at the same time. So um, that's a huge part of the job. And so, so we did that on that first shoot with him. And um, it was, uh, it was in, I believe it was a good night game. And um, so six months later, I got called to shoot his album cover. I was really surprised and very excited. Yeah. Um, but they, that, that is what they wanted. They want look a uh, very dark and moody and and you know I, well, I don't you know, capture you capture what the artist looking for the Robert Plant Allison Krauss just fantastic record which I didn't I honestly didn't know till you mentioned uh, um, on Instagram uh, on Raising Sand that that that's your image that's that just captures that record so I mean it captures them but it just there's so many different things about that photograph that that I just love and and um you know we're not going to get into everybody but obviously keith richards you, you tell a great story about he came down and the guy brought his vodka and orange juice first and and you're able to get really a wonderful wonderful shot of keith which um you know as uh today everybody thinks of keith as the only guy that doesn't need to wear a mask <laughs> i think that's pretty much <laughs> as most people think about keith richards um but you shot neil young and tom hanks and and randy newman uh, on a bicycle, which was just really, what, what, where did that idea come from? It just, you saw the bike and said, Randy, just ride yeah. around, you know? Well, Randy's fun. So you can do anything with Randy. <laughs> <laughs> he, he just, he likes fun. He's going to go along, he goes along with whatever you want to try. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we had done some nice safe shots, you know, earlier in the day. And um, there was the bike, there was a bike in the studio and, and, you know, I don't, honestly, I don't remember if I asked him to ride around on the bike or if he decided he wanted to ride around on the bike. <laughs> it could have gone either way. <laughs> right, right. But, well, um, 
Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. No, they're, they're they're terrific, and 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 uh, you know Frank buried the lead here, but the w Willie Nelson stuff is is spectacular. Um, and uh, just talk a little bit about that experience a little bit more, because that's very recent. Yes, that was right? that was recent. That was a real honor to be um, asked to shoot Willie Nelson. Um, we went down to his ranch, um, Luck, Texas, mm -hmm. and I was thrilled about that because what a great location. Um, we went the day before, the day before the shoot. Um, we didn't know really how long we were going to have with him. We didn't really know what the weather was going to be. It was, I think it might have been in February. So it was a little cold. Um, so we had to kind of, and, and, and the ranch, there was one building that did have heat. And then the other structures didn't. So it was really about figuring out how we were going to make him the most comfortable and be ready to move through to get as many setups as we possibly could um, in a short amount of time. And just, you know, again, just to kind of make him comfortable. So we went the day before, we did a location scout. I picked about six different spots where I knew I wanted to shoot. And the day of the shoot, we got there early and made sure that everything was set up, every light was set up, every mark was set so that we can just boom, 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 move him through the setup. But the one thing he did say to me was that he didn't like to pose. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, not a problem. There will be no posing here. No, no posing allowed. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's just, the, like I said earlier, the very first and most important thing is to, to develop a rapport with the person that you're photographing to get them to trust you, to know, let them know that they can trust you and to stay out of their way and allow them to open up and just, you know, capture, try to capture something real. Mm -hmm. So, um, Willie was great. He was fun. He was funny. He was incredibly giving and generous with his time. He didn't get annoyed with me <laughs> for asking him to do certain things. And, you know, we, we really had a great day. And then at the end of the day, probably, well, one of my favorite parts of the whole day, he had an old truck. And I said, um, can I photograph you with your truck? And everybody was like, oh, no, 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 no. You don't, you don't want to go out with him in that truck. And I was like, yeah, I do. I, I, I would love to photograph him. No, you're crazy. You can't go out with him in that truck. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I don't know what the big deal is about the truck. Right? <laughs> and they're like, all right, I'm just telling you now, it's at your own risk. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'll take it. So Willie was like, let's go. So we get in the truck. It's just he and I. It's not the assistants. It's not the whatever crew we had there, right? It's just he and I. And I turned to him and I said, finally, I've got you alone. <laughs> I said, let's go. <laughs> so off we go in the truck. And there was this little pink house on the property. I said, drive by that pink house. Let's do a couple photos there. So we drive by the pink house. I get out of the passenger side and I hop into the back of the pickup truck. I hop into the back of the truck and I'm shooting him through the window and through the side mirror and through the back window and suddenly he starts to take off. <laughs> the, truck starts, the, the, the truck starts to move and then it starts to move a little faster. <laughs> And now I realize what they were trying to exactly. tell me. <laughs> well, you were warned. Like, oh, I was warned. I was like, hey, Willie. <laughs> so, of course, I stopped the truck and I got back in the passenger seat and we had a big laugh. And, um, and he drove me all around the property. Oh, and wow. we took just the two of us. And yeah. it was just, it was like, it was so much fun. And it was yeah. just so what a What a remark. His face is just. And it's always been just just so photogenic to begin with, but you know the actually the yeah. older he's gotten, the more just more just just a fascinating Beautiful. just to watch him at yeah. any time and speaking speaking of road trips and I guess it was the late nineties Bruce is putting together ghost of tom jode and and you guys went out well, you were supposed to go out to the Mojave desert and you wound up leaving a little late 
just give us a little snapshot yeah. of that story. Because those those yeah. are wonderful photos that were used for a number of different things. Yeah, so we did make it to the Mojave Desert, but um, my original idea was to go out to El Mirage, which is a dry lake bed, which was quite a bit further, um, maybe a couple hours, hour and a half outside of LA. Uh, we got a late start in the day. And um, so by the time we got out to the desert, you know, it was maybe three, four in the afternoon, the sun's starting to go down and we haven't shot a single frame yet. So I said, let's just pull over. We literally just pulled over to the side of the road and there was a chain link fence and we started taking some pictures and um, took some photos in a couple different locations and we're losing light pretty fast. And so the highway was up on the ridge and I saw that there was still light up there. So I said, let's run up to the highway and get some pictures up there. So we ran up to the highway and Bruce starts walking down the highway. And I'm shooting really fast because the sun's going down really fast. And I've got high speed film in the camera and he's walking down the highway. And you can tell in the photos, the headlights are on in the car. So that's yeah. how it was getting dark. Um, and we shot this whole series of images, which after I processed the film and we were looking at them, um, it was like a little film. It was like, because I was shooting so fast to get the, the shot. And what they did was they took a whole bunch of those images and they put them together and they used them for the advertising um, spot, which was like a 20 second spot for the album. And um, from there, I got a call from the record company actually, and they said, dude, you know, we really love what we did with the commercial and we're thinking about doing the video. Just all stills, would you be interested? And of course, um, I'm interested. And that turned out to be um, really an amazing project for me. Um, I, I really planned it. I planned it as much as I could. First of all, if you don't have a great song, you don't have a great video. So right. it's really, no, it's really, I mean, it was there, like, a ma it, absolutely yeah, a yeah, masterpiece. Yeah. And that I got to visually put images to that was mm -hmm. yeah. really incredible for me. So I, I literally got in my car and for three weeks, sometimes by myself, sometimes with uh, just an assistant I took with me um, and drove around, so drove mm. around the desert, drove around the Mojave Desert mm. um, and shot thousands of images that uh, to, to I, I kind of had it storyboarded, you know, just like loosely with some ideas, um, but we shot thousands of images and from those, I, I, that's really one of the projects that I'm the most proud of and mm -hmm. feel like I, I, I would love to do something like that again. And um, it's really meaningful to me. And Frank, obviously, of course, you, because it's my brother and, of course. and to be able to, you know, work with your sibling on a creative level like that is. On, on truly one of, one of the best, uh, just one of, I mean, everyone's got their favorites, but that, that is in my top five always. Yeah, Frank, you wanted to, in. yeah, please. Yeah. Way back when, uh, you know, after Pam had, had done that job, uh, and the album came out, and so forth mm -hmm. and so on, um, Colleen Sheehy, who was at the time the curator of the Frederick Wiseman Museum uh, in the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis, uh, was the first, I think, the first museum to do a Bruce Springsteen retrospect. It was called right. Bruce Springsteen or the Highway. And I was uh, honored to have a few photographs in that. And um, I went out to the opening on the opening day. And I was hoping to see Pam uh, at that one, but um, I was out there with uh, David Rose, who did um, uh, Lucky Town and uh, right. Human Time. Mm -hmm. and a few, uh, there was, uh, you know, Dave Marsh and a, and a few other folks, uh, good folks were out there. However, the reason I'm saying is Pam was given an entire room, this gigantic room, and 40, count them folks, 4-0 of her Ghost of Tom Joad series photographs blown up very large were just all over that room. And to walk into that room with Pam's photos of her brother in the, and the desert and everything was an experience unto itself. 
as a you know as part of a museum experience. So. Uh, mm. Yeah. Thank you, Frank. Uh, that's great. No, I'm glad you brought that up because that's that's great. So a couple kind of lightning round things I wanted to get to, um, but I did want to ask you first because Frank and I were talking yesterday, and kind of he and Bruce and Stephen and Southside and kind of the Jersey guys kind of have their own little saying, their little "Hey Jersey," um, which is just kind of a reference to to Jersey guys living the Jersey life for so many years, and 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 here you are now you're you're kind of a hey jersey again so uh do, do you feel that way or, or or are you just sort of like you know kind of a half a hey jersey <laughs> <laughs> you know i mean yeah i guess i mean obviously i my whole family is here my whole family has always been here my mom is here sure. um i have been deeply connected um and and drawn and and have longed to be back here with them for for such a long time yeah, um, yeah. so i'm really thrilled uh to, to be spending this time here oh really I'm ab time. absolutely and you know in some ways we have another kind of don mclean moment here i was thinking about this yesterday uh with the pandemic which is kind of forced uh in some ways another day that music died um you know it's out there it's out there to listen to it's out there to stream it's out there to enjoy on vinyl um john resnick happens to be my neighbor lead singer of the goo goo dolls he came out on his porch one day played a couple of songs for the neighborhood so i mean there are people that are that are doing these amazing things obviously bruce was so positive on on east street uh, yesterday on the channel uh talking about another day of fifty thousand fans singing and yelling at him in stadiums and um it's kind of hard maybe to see that today but you know it is something that i do believe we'll see again but, but what do you guys think about the next few years in the music industry you've both spent so much of your your lives um in this industry you, you know do you think there's a new normal for every industry as, as 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 people are saying but um what do you think changes and what do you think stays the same frank oh, you want to yeah. i'm concerned um music as a going concern will always be there i mean from the time that first guy uh came out of his cave and put a few rocks together and made a noise music will be there it will evolve it will live on there's no question that our lives uh have changed and uh it's not never ever going to be quite the same going forward however uh music is there it's there for us it's there to uh enjoy it's there to soothe our souls it's there to rev us up it's there for whatever reason you know that we that we love music so i don't you know the stadium stadium type uh, events uh, may not happen for a while and uh, we're all going to miss that but people are still going to record people are still going to put out music uh and eventually we'll get back to enjoying it uh you know in stadiums again but music right. will never go never will go away no no never i mean it was so interesting in the middle of all this that bob dylan dropped that the song about uh, kennedy's assassination that 16 minute uh i i, I just I, I couldn't stop listening to it it was just just incredible and i'm sure you know, so many writers like your brother, I'm sure, are are, are working on on music now that um, will somehow comment on on this incredible time that that we're going through. Um, this came up with Danny Clinch, so I thought I'd bring it up with you. Um, in the age of digital media, how do you control your own images and maintain credit when things wind up online or in films or can easily be shared on the internet? And you know. Frank, I, I know you've dealt with this a lot. I mean, you can start with this and then I'd like to hear what Pam has to say. Um, also, to your last point, uh, Rolling Stones, uh, Ghost in a Ghost Town. Don't forget that one. Yeah, oh, that's true. Um, give me the question again, please. Well, really, I'm talking about digital media and how you control your own images, maintain credit when, you know, things are just winding up all over the place. One of my dear friends is Eric Miola, and we all right. know Eric, you know, and his beautiful, beautiful photography. Right. He, uh, 
For those who don't, he shot Born to Run, the cover of Born to Run. So, well, <laughs> amongst uh, many Eric, others. Yes, Eric and I talk a lot about this because our images <laughs> pop up on, you know, on a coffee mug here or a sneaker there or some guy in Belgium that put this out or that. It, we we started, you know, putting a guy bosh on it and. Uh, you know, getting in touch with the people and taking it off of certain websites and so forth and so on. But I think after a, a long, long time of being associated with certain photographs, it gets to be, you know, uh, just an unending battle. And, and I guess, the, I don't, you know, I don't know if Eric's um, acquiesced to it yet or not or capitulated, but I got to the point where, hey, if you want to use the damn photographs, go ahead and use the damn photographs, you know. Mm -hmm. But if you're making humble, you know, hey, give me a call. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's fair. Pam, have you dealt with that? Yeah, I think it's a really tricky situation. Um, I don't know how you stay on top of it. I think you kind of, you know, do the best that you can. I mean, I've had an experience, a few experiences. Um, uh, there was one website, some a rock and roll auction website or something that I was on one day and there were my proof sheets, proof sheets from a shoot at, like that I did in the 90s and with my phone number. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> because, it, because when you, when you sure. get the proof sheets up from the lab, there was your name and your phone number. <laughs> right, right, yeah. You know, they put it on the proof sheet. Mm -hmm. So there are these proof sheets uh, uh, for sale. And I'm thinking, first of all, how in the world did they get them? How did they get them? Um, I don't know, but you know, and then, and then I was walking through the Grove, which is a big uh, mall in Los sure. Angeles. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, everybody knows the Grove now. Yep. And there's this really fancy clothing store and there in the window was a t-shirt with my, one of my photos, a Bruce on it, uh, one of my original photos of Bruce, um, on the t-shirt in the window, they're probably selling it for like $200 or something. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's like, I don't know. I, I, don't, I, I, I don't really know uh, other than, you know, I mean, there's copyright laws, um, but it's with Instagram, Facebook, I mean, it's just so easy for your, for your photos to just be, you know, you, Right around you can't really completely control that um i do appreciate people like lynn goldsmith who really fight hard for copyright right. protection on yeah. behalf of all photographers right danny um, danny said the same thing that she's really kind of led the way and it just it's just one of those yeah. things that i know drives me nuts when i see that with all all form of artists i just think it's so wrong um so if if you know it, we wave the magic wand and you know, you, you could photograph any famous people alive or dead that, you know, you would have loved to have the opportunity. Um, I'm going to give you each a chance to maybe name a couple people that kind of just jump out. Pam, someone? Yeah, someone asked me this the other day. Um, I have an answer. Van Morrison. I've always wanted to photograph Van Morrison. Ever since I started shooting, I've wanted to photograph Van Morrison, and I've never had the chance. <laughs> Is he always been one of your favorite musicians? Is that, is yeah. it that, is the music? Yeah. 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 Frank? Richards. Pammy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Willie Nelson. Yeah. Willie. <laughs> Patty Smith, Frank photographer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Between the two of you, you've covered, you've covered, um, you know, I guess I was thinking a little further back in the Elvis and, you know, and, you know, and some of those people, but, uh, Beethoven, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how well Beethoven photographed, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what, you know, there, I guess I have to ask you this song. I, um, the folks at Backstreets are going to be kind enough and, and put this podcast out. Um, and there's so many people that would probably love to, the question always comes up with Bruce fans. Uh, what's your favorite song? What's your favorite song? And I hate that question personally. And now I'm going to ask it to both of you. Um, but because it's so hard to put it in, put it in words because so many different songs mean so many different things. That's all right. My dogs are barking right now. So in the background, the male's here. So it's that time of day. Um, so let Ivy bark, whatever. 
Um, but uh, are, are there a couple that just sort of, I don't know, desert island discs that, that just really, really jump out at you, you know? I mean, I know that's hard, Pam. I mean, there's just so many. And so personal, you're too. What, you're asking what my favorite song is? Well, you could you could have a couple. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know, sitting there, I, I would imagine, and I was thinking about this last night, I was thinking about taking my mom and we, uh, when, when your brother was on Broadway and, uh -huh. and we were having this conversation um, afterwards. Um, and again, she's loved his music along with me for many years. And, you know, and, and being there that night um, and she had never really heard the wish before, for example, um, which obviously is about your mom. And, and she just said, that's it. That's the song. Um, but you know, they're personal and I, I know that they're, they're meant, they're many, but, I'm just wondering if anything just jumps jumps out. Yeah, there are so many. It's really impossible. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's, it's Frank, um, you want to, Frank, you jump in. Yeah. I know okay. Frank's got the songs book. So uh <laughs> he's he's ready. <laughs> I guess my all-time favorite, because it's just such a an epic, is Bruce's Jungle Land. Um, the way it just builds up the crescendo, and uh, I mean, I get emotional at the end when when uh, Clarence comes in with that saxophone solo, yeah, and getting this vision, you know, being a, hanging out a lot at the Jersey Shore and all that kind of stuff, and because I went to the Steel Pier and uh, right. The, you're in all these different places up and down the coast. I mean, when that stack solo cuts in, I see Clarence standing on a stage out yeah. over the ocean, some yep. dance hall with one beam of bright light just right. coming down. And he's just wailing. And I mean, no matter what I'm doing or where I'm at, if I'm in the car or I, I go by someplace or, or I'm home, or, as soon as that song comes on, I stop whatever I'm doing. Yeah, it's kind of like the Godfather in, in many ways for, for many people where uh, it's on, I, I, that's it, I'm done. Or for my wife, Titanic, everyone sort of has their own movie. But the Jungle Land, I, I, I get. Carol and I reunited. My, Carol was, my wife is, was my high school sweetheart. And we had uh, broke up many, many years ago. And then we right. had whole lives in between. Right. And, and we reunited about 20 years ago. And it was that uh, I took uh, her to see Bruce in, in uh, Atlantic City. He was playing the, the mm -hmm. ball in Atlantic right. City on the. And, that the uh, night he played "Tell Me Why" the Beatles. Yeah, but it, but the one that got us was "Days mm -hmm. of Hope and Dreams." Uh, yeah, that that became our song, you know. Cause sure. We for this yeah. part of. The oh, ab absolutely, absolutely terrific, and uh, and actually, I was sitting with. Um, uh, uh, I think it was Jake, yeah, what, at the Blinded by the Light premiere, um, the movie. And when that part of the movie, when they cut to Clarence's solo, uh, it, was a, it was a difficult moment, I'm sure, for not just for fans, but especially his family, you know. Frank? Can I interject? Sure. Blinded by the uh, Seth Ruz Manzor, who wrote the book, you know, right. Barry Park. Many, many, many years ago, when he came over to this country, he actually wanted to meet me, and he came down. And Carol and I were just getting together. It's about we had to, we got in this house, so it had to be about 20 years ago, 18 years ago, or something. And he came down. He, I was looking at all my my photographs, and we became friends. And then he kind of, you know, got married and got into mm -hmm. his own life in England and all. But um, when I saw that movie and saw five or six of my mm -hmm. photographs, right. <laughs> In his movie. entire bedroom <laughs> yeah that was that was kind of, of a huge tribute to you that 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 one scene and that's interesting that he came to see you um this is a question i ask on every show um and maybe means more now than ever but if if you had the ability to put up a billboard today and leave a message um you can write anything on it for the world to see what would it say and and maybe why Pam? Okay, I'll go first. I'll use a quote, <laughs> use a quote from my mother. Um, she once told me, as long as we're happy and we're healthy and we love each other, that's the whole thing. 
Wow. Love that. Frank? Uh, Pam just said something that made me think of my mom, and she said, as long as we, as long as we have food on the table and a roof over our head, uh, you know, we're always going to be happy and be together. No, uh, but I would put up a different billboard, I think, especially these days uh, with everything that's going on. I'm just going to say, it's your planet. Don't fuck it up. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's for sure. So, folks, um, remember, you can obtain these magnificent photos that we've been talking about by Frank Stefanko, Pam Springsteen, through their websites, through the Morrison Hotel Gallery site. We're going to link up on the show page. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Frank put out one of the most amazing photography books ever, um, which, you know, as I said, I was really proud to be uh, uh, kind of an early patron of, of, which is called Further Up the Road, um, which really opened up all of his archives of all of his work with Bruce over the years, a lot of beautiful landscape work. And it's, as I said, it's really a treasure that I keep on my baby grand piano because it's too good to sit on a coffee table. Um, and I, I go on gushing about it forever, but I, and Frank knows how much, how important that book is and, and just how special it is. And um, I, I will link you to that book. Are there, are there a few copies still available before I yeah. offer that? Okay. <laughs> The deluxe copy, right? Uh, there were 350 of those. They were mm -hmm. they went like that, right? But we have plenty of collectors' editions mm -hmm. uh, left. Um, you know, they, you can get through the galleries or through World of Sound Gallery with Guido Harari, right? And, um, you know, in, in in Italy, his his gallery. Uh, so they're available uh, still in numbered and signed editions. Mm -hmm. I know Pam has one. <laughs> yeah. Yep, I love yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Pam, any, any other places people should, you know, to look for your photographs? Morrison Hotel, your website. That... MorrisonHotelGallery.com, PamelaSpringsteen.com. Great, yep. great. Well, Pam, Frank, I want to thank you so much for, for your kindness um, and, and being the, our guest today. And I know we were going to be out in Asbury Park and having a lot of fun doing something, but um, this is our world today. And, and I appreciate you bringing the combined wisdom, these stories to our audience. Um, during these difficult times, it's nice to remember the past and look forward to, to getting back to, as you say, Frank, our land of hope and dreams and maybe out of this darkness on the edge of all of our towns. So stay safe, stay healthy. Plan, please wish your mom, Adele, who just turned 95. Um, we're all thinking about her. Uh, of course, Mother's Day this weekend for, for all of you. And, um, and, and just keep take, taking pictures because the world needs to see these images more and more every day. And I want to give thanks, thanks to thanks Mike. Thanks for having us, Mitch. Oh, thank absolutely. Been, thanks so much. Been a pleasure. And I want to thank my production team at Resonate, Adam Hendricks. It's been a maestro helping me put this together. Um, I'm even going to give a shout out to my mom this week for Mother's Day. And, um, and he actually... I have to credit her because Pam, quite frankly, she's the one who said, why don't you interview his sister? That actually, <laughs> that was my mother's oh, idea. I mean, she, yeah, exactly. She's, she is something else. So um, thank everybody for listening. And as we say here every week, when saving, because sometimes this is a financial show, it has the name in it. When saving for your financial future, remember to always pay yourself first and have a great week. <laughs> okay.